All right, I believe the mic is hot. Yes, it is. Excellent. It's kind of a trumpet fanfare enter, entrance to the gladiators or something from Ben-Hur or something. I probably can find something like this. Today on the Play Ed Podcast, we return to Rome with the chariot racing simulation Circus Maximus. Welcome to the Play Ed Podcast, where we explore cultivating connections through play. Hello and welcome to the Play Ed Podcast. I'm your host, Laura. And I'm Chris. And we're here today to explore creating connections through play. So first, a little bit of the business as usual. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. A five-star review makes it easier for new listeners to find us. You can subscribe to us through the Podbean app, as well as podcatchers like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and TuneIn. And if you're having trouble finding us, add Laura and Chris along with Play Ed Podcast in the search terms, and it will probably turn up. Also, please share with your friends. If you're enjoying this and you'd like to help someone finding it, using the share uh, feature on most uh, apps is the easiest way to help other people find our show. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at PlayEdPod, and you can like our Facebook page at PlayEdPodcast. I am so glad I have a voice again this week. It's wonderful to have you speaking again. Yes. And we have cause for celebration over and above the recovery of your voice. We found our Circus Maximus pieces. Finally! I was looking for something completely unrelated, and as I tore the office apart... There was the envelope we put them in it and labeled so we wouldn't lose them. So actually, that's a great question. So um, it's been a little while since we've recorded, and some of that was me fighting off illness and not having a voice to record with. But the other half is that you actually got to spend a weekend playing games with our kids. I did. Well, with a couple of them. Um, Some friends of mine and I um, got together, and um, one of them has access to um, a camp um, down south of where we live and, um, was able to secure a cabin for a weekend, um, on a lake in the woods. Um, I had no cell reception the whole weekend. It was glorious. I got off grid. Now we weren't off grid roughing it. We were in a cabin. We had electricity. We had water. We had roaring fires. We had mosquitoes. Um, and we had two and a half straight days of playing Dungeons and Dragons in one form or another. Um, two of my boys came with me. Uh, they had a blast. Um, one of the other guys brought his son, who's about the same age as the boys I brought. Um, another guy was going to bring one of his sons, but he had schoolwork at the last minute and couldn't come. Um, uh, very cross, you know, the, there, were, there were some guys in there, you know, 40s, 50s, there were, you know, our teenagers, everybody just, you know, we cooked our own food and we rolled funny shaped dice and we spent the whole weekend gaming. I got to run a game that everybody enjoyed. A um, couple other guys ran their own games, which were interesting. Um, so no, we had a really, really good time and a lot of intensive time just with those two boys and talking about everything under the sun. Yeah. And it was in doing the preparation for the game you were running that as you were sifting through our, our gaming library, hunting for, uh, various game books, finally there tucked in the shelves where no one would ever suspect it. A yellow manila envelope labeled Circus Maximus. Are we allowed to say manila anymore? I'm not sure what else one calls such things. Okay. I I, I don't know. I mean, the, the rules of what you can say and can't say seem to change so often. Last I checked, it was still allowed. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Anyways. So we have the Circus Maximus pieces. We have the Circus Maximus rules. We never lost the board. It's still hanging up in the closet next to the winter coats. Uh, well insulated against moths by lots of cedar. Um, so now we can talk about Circus Maximus. Yes. 
So a happy November to you all. Uh, we're picking up again where we had left off in September with some more of the games that we were discussing um, as part of games we think of when we're talking about exploring Roman history and culture. And Circus Maximus is probably one of the most fun. Oh, absolutely. Most fun games that I can think of. So if you've seen the chariot race in Ben-Hur, that's what this game is based on. And so it doesn't strive to be an accurate recreation of actual historical chariot racing. Uh, For one thing, there are a lot more factions available in the game than there were historically. And that's A-OK. Because when you get a full board going and everybody's running full out, you get lots of wreckage, you get people being dragged, you get chariots jumping over each other. It's awesome. So, very brief game history. It's a board game, originally published by Babylon Publications in 1979, but most people who have played this game know it by its 1980 1980, uh, version published by Avalon Hill. Avalon Hill has some of the best games out there. And while most people, when they think of Avalon Hill, tend to think of some of their more complex war games... This is a very accessible, basic board game. Yeah, absolutely. Simulating a chariot race. And there was a companion game called Gladiator, which I actually don't have any of the parts and pieces for, but I've played at the gaming convention. Uh, And the two pair up really nicely if you want to kind of explore. They're definitely more, as I said, rooted in that Hollywood vision of gladiator combat and chariot racing. But there's still a whole lot of fun, and they can open that door to asking questions about these aspects of Roman life. So, you mentioned gaming conventions. In fact, the Wikipedia article mentions them as well because it's become very popular at gaming conventions. If you're having a regular version of the game, the game board is a long, oblong board with a Roman chariot track laid out on it, um, and several um, rows that you can race along in. There are lanes. Several lanes. Um, I'm thinking the board's maybe, what, three feet long, two and a half feet long? Yeah, that's... yeah, it's about, th- it's about th- it's, it's like three foot by um, 18 inches or so is the board I have. The one we use at the gaming mm-hmm. convention is um, like... Four times larger. I mean, it's... It's it's a 10 to 12 foot long, and you have, instead of chits, they actually have little replica chariots that they will use. Um, Which they got custom made after we started running it. Originally, we were running it on a um, one inch... We were using one inch square pieces instead of the quarter inch die cut pieces that I've got. Uh, And they were magnet backed. Ah. So it was mounted to to a piece of sheet metal. She made it really heavy, and you couldn't hang it up anywhere. <laughs> no, you couldn't. But if you flipped it, the pieces didn't slide around because they were magnetic. Yeah. So, it's a chariot racing board game. You can have up to eight players, which is four more than the number of factions that were in traditional Roman chariot racing. Um, you have a oval track, and charioteers are encouraged to physically attack their opponents with whips, force opposing chariots into walls. You can whip your own horses, you can whip your opponent's horses, and you can whip your opponent. And you can use wheel-mounted blades to try to destroy your other opponent's chariots. But only if you've got a very heavy chariot, which moves slower than the lighter weight chariots. So, the actual gameplay is obviously... Oh, it's chaotic and fun. So you have a character sheet, um, and on the character sheet you get to make note of things like your horse team and how much exhaustion, how much you've exhausted your horses, how heavy your chariot is, which determines its maximum speed, but also determines how much damage it can, it can take. Um, you, you, there's a dice table you consult, you roll some dice and you find out how, how good a a team of horses you have, uh, are, um, and then everybody lines up and you write down how much of your horse's maximum speed you want to make use of in the next round. Everybody submits their orders and then kind of like in diplomacy, they get flipped over and they all get adjudicated simultaneously. Um, so you can have people try to move into the same lane at the same time and they crash. 
Um, you can have somebody who's trying to take a turn at a certain speed and their neighbor whips their horses and that makes them go faster than they planned and they end up wrecking the chariot. Um, the straightaways, you can go full out, but if you go into a turn going too quick, you can flip. you've got a high risk of flipping and the faster you're going, the higher the risk of flipping. Flipping means you can end up being dragged by your horses you might have to try and cut yourself loose and then run off the track while getting while avoiding being run over by everybody else. Um, it's I, I've played it several times at the gaming convention and we have we always have a blast. It's it's always just a, a bloodbath. So, out of curiosity, how hard do you find this game to learn to play if you're a new player? New players, I think, can pick it up very very quickly. Um, I mean, at this point, I for the last couple of years, I don't think it's been easy to get into a game at the gaming convention. But when they first started bringing it, a lot of people had never heard of it. and Or we'd heard of it but never been able to play it. Because uh-huh. um, collector sets are, are expensive. Yes. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I picked it up in about five minutes. Um, uh, I know a lot of people... Uh, who showed up at the gaming con for the first time, and they learned it very, very quickly as well. A couple of those people even went on to win um, various heats. Um, we've got a big trophy now for whoever wins it every year and, and that sort of thing. Um, you can teach even, I'd say, older school age children, so third, fourth, fifth grade-ish, um, pretty easily. The, the hard thing for anybody younger than that is the whole idea of having to write down the speed you want to go and submit it secretly, and then it all gets resolved um, at the same time. That gets to be challenging for younger players for the same reason that we were discussing that you need to play kind of open-faced with some of these mystery, deductive reasoning games we've been talking about the last few weeks. All right, that I think brings us into a really good place to look at as far as what the game can teach when you're playing it, what are we looking at in terms of skills? What are we looking at in terms of content knowledge? So in terms of skills, um, mental arithmetic. Um, you're not, as the game is usually played, you're not allowed to count the squares on the board. You have to have a feel for how many there are and be able to do that mental arithmetic and, and figure out... An estimation. An estimation. And you've got it all... You're also trying to estimate against a risk-reward curve. That because there's um, uh, negative consequences for running your horses too conservatively, um, you can be outrun and you lose the race. But if you push them too hard too early, they run out of endurance, they can't go any any further. If you take your turns too fast, you flip. But if you don't take them fast enough, everybody else blows by you because they're willing to take those chances. So in many ways, you're running with the same actual things that you have in true racing, which is go all out, risk tiring too soon, and so judging, when do you go fast? When do you pull back? What are the right risks to take? And how do you minimize risks and increase rewards? Exactly. Um, there's also a sort of campaign set of rules. We don't play through them at the Gaming Con. I've never actually used them. But you can set up to where, as each successive race is done... Um, you either have prize money or uh, debts to pay off um, in game currency, which is tracked in sesterces, as ancient Romans would have, um, to either buy better horses, buy better drivers, improve your car, um, put another team into the race, etc., who can, who can work as an ally. Um, there's there's a, a big expansion that's all in the box. Um and so you can start exploring things like betting systems and odds and what do those ratios actually mean um, with something that's a little more concrete than trying to do it using something like poker or blackjack. Yes. And I think that actually brings me to, from a standpoint of making a living, I remember when you once told me that you spent some time working in the world of financial analysis. And while you had certainly taken classes in school 
that covered some of those areas, you mentioned that it was playing games that dealt intuitively with probability and statistics that actually gave you what you needed to work in that world. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I started playing Dungeons and Dragons and shortly thereafter board war gaming, uh, when I was 11, uh, and by, you know, 12 or 13, I was, I was a very, very heavy board war gamer, constantly playing, Minis war games, Dungeons and Dragons, and other role playing games, uh, and then Hex and Chit war games, and all of those have under the surface whatever the the accidental trappings of the game you're playing. All of them have some kind of statistically based resolution mechanic for uncertainty, um, and. Doing so much of that over the next 10 to 12 years into my 20s, by the time I started working in corporate finance and having to deal with statistics, I hadn't formally taken a class in statistics in school at that point, but I had a really intuitive grasp of statistics and probability and could could qualitatively evaluate outcomes in a way that some of my better educated peers couldn't. Uh, and, so, and that served me really, really well for the for for more than the decade that I was I was uh, working in finance professionally. And so, one of the things that you get from playing a game that t- plays very heavily into not only having probability and statistics as part of the resolution mechanic, but a lot of the decisions being based on understanding those, it can offer a qualitative complement to formal education in statistics. Right. So that. As you go along, you start building that internal sense of, is that right? That doesn't feel right. And it helps build that check against your numbers so that you can go back and say, I'm pretty certain this doesn't look right. And go back and realize, oh, I did my math wrong. Because the time that you've spent playing games like this gives you an intuitive sense of what ought to be. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of my, my I'm, I'm not, I don't work professionally in fine, well, I my full-time job is no longer in finance, but I still have a lot of work that, you know, there's that intuitive sense of this this doesn't pass the sniff test, and then I can dig in, oh, that's what's wrong, and, you know, we can have frank conversations about actual, you know, business realities with my clients or with my developers or whatever. Um, I wouldn't be able to do that if I hadn't spent as much time playing weird games like, you know, Circus Maximus and and um, Civilization and whatnot, that just because you iterate so rapidly through these decision cycles and experiencing the cause and effect and um, with other games like Diplomacy, um, even Monopoly to some extent, you've got a whole social component of negotiation that's also a part of it. There's a there's a whole realm of what tend to get written off as soft skills that get cultivated absolutely without you realizing that's what's happening mm-hmm. um, if you spend enough time playing these games with each other. And the rapid iteration is an important part because developing intuitive uh, knowledge comes through doing something so often that it stops being something you think about and becomes something you know. Right, exactly. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of where where it, where the difference is between, say, formally studying something in a class and the complement that comes from learning it. I did eventually take formal classes in statistics. A lot of what I studied made intuitive sense, and because I had all this experiential learning under my belt. In the I, same way that studying geometry makes sense when you spent a lifetime measuring things and seeing enough triangles that a formal proof of something being a triangle is a, well, yes, of course, because triangledness is already something you're familiar with. Right, right. You transcend that which is self-evident. And, yes. and it allows you to understand what's going on on a, on a very visceral level as well as a rational intellectual level. And you can kind of proceed with life with, with both of those tools in your kit. Mm-hmm. So the other area that struck me that this is great is that if you're doing a study of Roman history, it is a really fun and accessible intro into one of the most interesting areas of Roman life, which was 
chariot racing games in general i mean there's there's a reason that that juvenile criticizes the the roman mob as being interested only in bread and circuses um and yet in in a in, in a lot of ways that that is what much of the 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 call it the low information voter of the roman world they were citizens but they had not much many of them lived on the grain dole thus the free bread um, and existed for the circuses, where you didn't have to buy a ticket for admission. Um, they were put on by wealthy people or by the city magistrates at the magistrate's own personal expense. Um, tax money wasn't used to, to fund these things until the imperial period, and by that point everything in, in Rome has changed socially. But so much of Roman life centered around these four factions, historically speaking. There were four factions... Um, and, you know, the, the kind of devotion we associate with, you know, the Bears or the Cowboys or the Redskins or the Saints for, like, NFL has nothing, nothing, not even a shadow of a glimmer of a comparison with the kind of violent, lifelong devotion Romans had for their chariot factions. Um, and for the sometimes slave drivers and sometimes free drivers who became celebrities, um, really on a par with our biggest celebrities today, and the same could happen in the gladiatorial arena. Um, both of them are critical, critical components of ancient Roman life, ancient Roman civic life, and they have their roots in um, Etruscan and early Roman uh, activities related to funeral games. And then they, they grow into these huge businesses with, with, um, the equivalent of millions of dollars changing hands and stars and endorsements and product placements. I mean, what we have with NASCAR here in the United States today is really just a modern variation. The track is still basically the same. The devotion to the drivers is the same. The kind of rivalries that are sometimes constructed by the press. I imagine if they had product endorsements. They had product endorsements. They did have product endorsements. Um, and that's the thing. The Romans are in so many ways. We're not that different. Um, the, 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 the technology that makes it go is different. They had a maximum of four horses we get a few hundred more under the bonnet. Um, you know, but you're still driving fast and turning left. Yeah. Um, so, you know, watch cars, and it's just kind of a modern, you know, watch watch a NASCAR race, go get the tickets and buy one and sit there, and in the heat and the smell and the, the, the whole pageantry of the thing. And, you, you know, 2,000 years ago, your ancient Roman ancestors were doing exactly the same thing. Yes. And so from a standpoint of getting into that, you can get a little aspect of the degree of excitement that comes from the madness of the race in progress. Yeah. Because, all right, I love chariot racing. I remember the Ben-Hur movie growing up. And then um, it's kind of semi-topical since I'm planning to do a rewatch of all of the Star Wars movies as the next one's coming up this December. And... The pod racing in in uh, the Phantom Menace is it's straight out of the Ben Hur. It's, it's a love letter to Hollywood san sword and sandal movies, and particularly to Ben Hur. That the whole prequel trilogy that Lucas put out is his love letter to the sword and the sandal movie genre. It is, but I think that the pod race really is a great example because again, you've got the opportunity for glory or horrible demise. And you've got some drivers who are more aggressive than others, whether it's Sebulba or Chick Hicks. Um, and you've got other drivers who are a little more cautious and lose for that. And you've got some in the middle who, who manage to find the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a good starting point that if you're wanting to dive into another world, you can look at it and say, here are the points where there's something that is familiar. Right. The race is a familiar thing. And then from there, you can go to the less familiar f parts, like the fact that Roman sporting events all have their history in their religion. And that is something of a, of a big leap because that it's a question, okay, so what about Roman religion meant that horse racing and fights to the death were 
a part of life, what's that connection? And that's your entry point. You start with the thing that's familiar and makes sense and is fun, and that becomes a starting point for a conversation. Right, right. I mean, it's it, it's... It serves a role that we we tend to think our sports don't in the modern world, but they do. Um, when you look at the way people behave around, say, football contests in particular, but to a lesser extent, baseball, uh, basketball, hockey, um, you've you've got essentially these these titans battling each other in a sort of reenactment of a creation myth. Um, and I had a professor who who went on and on and on about this in detail when I was an undergraduate. And I remember sitting in his class going, man, I, I, I don't know what dope you're smoking, but that's just way far out. Well, over this weekend, as I was talking with these guys and, you know, we've, so, some very, very educated guys, some very, very experienced guys, some very educated and experienced guys, and we're talking back and forth. Well, we start talking about football contests as a kind of titanomachy, a war among the titans, um, to determine, you know, which which gods will be ascendant. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of went off in that tangent, but we do have a culture, we're just not aware of it. Not unlike the Romans, where athletic competition serves a kind of proxy for warfare. It's a kind of ritualized way of engaging in friendly warfare. Um, and it, as a result, it connects with our very primitive need to have gods and monsters and titans and heroes. You look at the kind of scripted um, combat that you have in professional wrestling. You have the same kind of thing going on. These larger-than-life figures, um, devoted fans to one or the other. And, you know, a lot of these guys are friends off stage, but, you know, they've, they've gotta, they've gotta face off and play the role in order to enact the drama that, that the audience is expecting. And we tend as contemporary Americans, to believe that we're past that kind of thing. But going kind of askance of the whole question of content knowledge versus skills, there's something about recognizing what's essentially human about us. And being able to have a touchstone with the ancient Roman approach to sport and competition that we can identify in ourselves, we can recognize their essential humanity, our essential humanity, and the fact that some things don't change, even if we're not aware mm -hmm. of that fact. And then I happen to have a couple of reading recommendations that go along with this as well. Do tell. Uh, uh, yes. So I am very, very fond of uh, Carolyn Lawrence's The Roman Mysteries um, with Flavia Gemina mm -hmm. as the main protagonist. And it's the story of a young Roman girl in the early empire. It's a 79... Yeah, it's under the, under the Flavian dynasty. Under so the... around 79 AD. And she starts out around 10, and I think the stories end when she's 12. But it covers the very tumultuous and eventful years um, during that reign, um, I think of Titus. Yeah, it was the reign of Titus, which was only about two or three years. Um, Prior to Domitian. It's it's after Trajan's sack of Jerusalem mm -hmm. um, and and the, the, the raising of the city in the wake of that um, and before Domitian and his persecution of the Christians. And the series in general is one of my recommendations for anyone who wants to study the ancient Romans. Because Young adult fiction? Um, I would actually call it middle grade. Okay, middle grade is good. Middle grade. Um, some some of the material is, ranges into young adult, but solidly middle grade and highly informative about the Roman world, um, particularly since it goes into not only things like mythology and daily life, but um, poetry and philosophy and a whole host of other aspects. Oratory, literature. Law. It and there is one of the uh, books, Charioteer of Delphi, that goes very much into um, the whole world of the circus and the factions and everything that went into um, that aspect of Roman life. 
And it's a fantastic book that if you want to get into Roman games, that one is fantastic for digging into it, especially since it does get into, you know, how incredibly deeply people were devoted to one faction or another. Yes. It, it, it formed an aspect of identity as much as being a, a Patriots fan or... or a, More so. Yeah. More so. I mean, uh, you know, because there, there are people who if they move to a new city, that'll they'll adopt a new team. And that was just something the Romans didn't do. Yeah. Um, you know, if one... Fa- there, there, we, we have the phenomenon of Fairweather Johnsons, where, you know, you'll try to change your team loyalty based on who's winning. Because you just want to be with the winning team. You don't really care who it is that's doing the winning. Whereas the Romans were more greens for life. Or- oh, yeah. You know, death to blues kind of stuff. And um, that, that, that level of devotion really, really comes down, uh, comes through clearly in Carol and Lawrence's book, which I, I, I would recommend also. It's delightful. Mm-hmm. So, question for keeping it in the fun zone. Where would you say is the most likely places where this game can break down? So I've played this with my, you know, four, five, six-year-old kids in the past. Um, I think at that point, just kind of letting them move the chits around the board is really as much as you're going to get out of it. Once you're dealing with pretty solidly grammar school age kids who can do some simple arithmetic, um, and who can write their own orders out unsupervised. So call it about the same age as being able to read through the Flavia Gemini books. Yeah, I would say I would say absolutely. If if you've got kids who can who can tackle the Flavia Gemini books, the um, uh, by Carol and Lawrence, um, that's probably a good age to to you know pull out uh, Circus Maximus. Um, uh, Finding a copy might be a little difficult because it is out of print, which is a shame. It needs to be reprinted. It's it's a delightful game. Well, I will definitely have uh, I'll have links to the Board Game Geek site. They usually have links from there to current sales. Yeah, people that, trying to sell on the secondary market. Um, secondary market sales, uh, and. I've noticed that several Avalon Hill games are starting to go into reprint, so it's possible that that might be one of the ones on the slate. So Hasbro owns the intellectual property that was associated with Avalon Hill because they, I don't remember if they got it, I think they got it when they acquired Wizards of the Coast, because Wizards of the Coast had picked up Avalon Hill and TSR uh, right in the late 80s, early 90s. One of these days, we need to do a show just going through the family tree of what game companies have owned what. Um, yeah, yeah, we really should. Um, and so periodically, Hasbro will reissue some of the old Avalon Hill games or variants under them. They they still have an active Avalon Hill trademark. Um, I don't know, though... And, you know, maybe maybe we should talk to a product manager with uh, Hasbro at some point. I don't know how much of that IP that they own they actually have, like, masters for in order to reprint and reissue the games. Um, you know, they've got the titles, they've got the, the rights if they haven't lapsed based on the contracts. Um, but, like, Republic of Rome got reprinted I think under license, but it wasn't through Hasbro's Avalon Hill subsidiary who did a reissue of Republic of Rome a few years back. Um, you know, I think it'd be great if, if we could get um, uh, Circus Maximus and Gladiator just like reissued as a, a joint set kind of a thing. Yeah, it's currently not in print, so it would definitely be one to have to have that you'd have to find on the secondary market. But it's one that's worth doing, and if it's... And a good way to test it out is look for gaming conventions that might be doing that. Um, in the North Texas area, the North Texas Role Playing Convention does a big tournament every uh, June as part of the role playing convention there. And there's a couple other know, conventions that do that too. I, uh, I believe it gets, I want to say it gets run at Gen Con. Um, I think it gets run at Gary Con. Um, I don't know what other con. I know there are a bunch of cons where it's become very, very popular to run because, again, if you've got the board and if you've got the pieces, 
it it, it kind of plays itself once you get a group of people together and it, it you need as few as uh, it'll take as few as two players as many as eight on a given run around the board um you can make it longer or shorter um and special shout out to latin teachers if you're doing latin convention buying one of the the, the larger reproduction versions um, to run at a Latin convention, it would not be too hard to convert this game to play the game in Latin because there's not a heck of a lot of uh, difference in doing the cards in Latin versus English. Yeah, actually, that's that's um, that would be a real um, opportunity there as well. Yeah. So, but in terms of the pitfalls, the main thing is I think that age range. If you're playing with players of of about ten and up, I'd say so easily able to do a secret orders um, mm-hmm. and write it down. The intuition comes with time and, and replay. Yeah. And the other thing is um, it's a racing game. So be aware that somebody has got to win the race and everybody else by definition does not win the race. And some people may struggle with that. Uh, in which case the general rule of if you have a game with winners and losers Learn to play it fast so that you can have multiple rounds. And that way you don't have the, I lost the game and now I'm going to be upset for the week. If you can play two or three games in an afternoon, you've got a good chance that you're not going to have the same winner in every single game. Yeah, and the other thing I did when I was teaching my younger ones, um, and the thing I do whenever I'm teaching even a new uh, a, an adult who's new to the game is I play the first few races open. Yeah, you, you don't worry about the secret submit submitting of orders. Uh, and the other thing I'll do is I'll do really reckless things like go into a speed at absolutely full, uh, go into a turn at absolutely full speed, just so they can see what a wreck looks like. Yeah. You know, they can figure out side slipping. They can figure out wreckage. Um, most of the special rules for the game happen in the turns. Yeah. Almost everything, the straightaways are actually relatively boring. You try and get through them as quickly as possible. But those turns, that's where you've got opportunities to cut people off. That's where you've got opportunities where a well-placed whipping of your opponent's horses will just force them into a wreck. And so while you're learning <clears throat> play open, you're not going to have as many surprises, obviously. Um but once you can submit secret orders, that's where the fun begins because then you've got people making decisions simultaneously without knowing necessarily what their neighbor's going to do. And that adjudication is going to mean interesting things are going to happen once that is being done secretly. Yeah, I mean, basically game theory at work. All of a sudden, you've got a prisoner's dilemma times eight or actually to the eighth power if you've got a full table. Mm-hmm. You, you, how much do I put in? How much is too much relative to everybody else? And you're not just making the decision on what are the odds. I know if I'm going into that straight from the straightaway at full speed into the turn, I'm likely going to turn over. I can adjust my speed, but I don't know what the guy next to me is going to do. Right. And, right. When, and when that's the case, that's where a lot of the fun happens. So... I think that covers this. This is a fantastic game to hunt down or see if you can find a convention playing it to get a chance to see it. Um, Really good one for entering into Roman culture and probably one of the easiest to learn because it's such a straightforward um, area in terms of object of the game. To my mind, it's the form of beer and pretzels game. You, you can, you can be drinking heavily and eating junk food and only halfway paying attention to the game, which is what you see at the con still. Well, yeah, yeah, (laughs) still have a halfway decent chance of winning. And regardless, you're going to have fun no matter what. So the, the only thing I would say in, in summation is that the Roman exclamation whenever a chariot wrecked during a race was naufragium which means shipwreck and so i think to end this episode on naufragium and now a few more questions with our children about games do you like playing games I love playing games. Card games, board games, role-playing games. I just love playing games. What do you like most about playing games? Well, I can make decisions because 
there is a wide amount of decisions for different types of games. Okay. Are there any particular games you like more than others or any particular decisions you enjoy making more than others? Well, I really like card games, especially made by the uh, makers of Outbox because they have a beautiful assortment of games. Can you mention some of your favorite games? Well, I like Sleeping Queens. Sleeping Queens is one of those games? Yeah. Um... Is Sushi Go by the same people? Yes. Okay. I love Sushi Go, Dragonwood. You've got a good selection of games that you get to play. Because you, you play games with your siblings as well as with me and mom, right? Yeah, and with our neighbor Ruby. Right, of course. She's the one who brings Sleeping Queens over. Oh, that's right. We don't own a copy, do we? Yeah. Okay. Um, What do you like least about playing games with me and mom? Um, well, because you two usually win. <laughs> when it's a game of, when it's a game where you could win. But when it's a game that we're just beginning to play, that's why I like you two in the games. Because you two can help me along. Do we do that? Yeah, you do. Okay, cool. So, we hope you've enjoyed today's discussion. All the games we've mentioned today can be found in the show notes. But now we'd love to hear from you. You can write to us at playedpod at gmail.com and find us on Instagram and Twitter at playedpod or on Facebook at playedpodcast. Please tell us your thoughts. And until next time, thanks for listening. Take care. Bye. Is there anything else you want our listeners to know? Yes! I love playing games because, well, there's something fun to do to express. I love this type of game. Okay. And new games, old games, games that were just beginning are always fun. All types of games are fun. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Have fun cutting that one up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>